Hi everyone. Uh, the, welcome to the QM Net seminar series, which is an informal uh, lecture series at the University of Melbourne related to any quantitative methods uh, uh, for social and, and physical scientists. Today we are very happy to have um, Francisco Mamaleo Cosillo uh, speaking. Francisco is a postdoctoral researcher at the Harvard School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and a research fellow at Input Output Hong Kong. Prior to this, he was a career development fellow in computer science at Balliol College at the University of Oxford. He completed a uh, DPhil in theoretical computer science under the supervision of Paul Goldberg and a BA in mathematics at Harvard University with the minor in neuroscience in 2012. His academic interests uh, lie in the intersection of algorithmic game theory, decentralized consensus protocols, and computational learning theory. He is also a co-organizer of the mechanism designed for social good research initiative. And today he's going to be telling us about his work on maximizing the utility of a limited number of COVID tests Thanks very much, Francisco. Okay. Thank you so much for the introduction, Patrick, and thank you all for, for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be talking at the Quantitative Method Seminar. I, I hope that the material today, um, it, it fits with the, the spirit of, of what I've seen at the seminar, both of bridging uh, quantitative methods, as you mentioned, for social applications and, and uh, more technical applications. And, and today I'm going to talk about, as you had Part of the initiative, it will be a bit of a two-part um, talk, uh, but it's on mechanism design for social good, a uh, research initiative with which I worked, and a, a specific project that was born out of this initiative on maximizing the utility of the limited number of COVID tests. And uh, so the overview of the talk uh, for today is that I'll begin by talking about uh, mechanism design for social good, or MB4SG as we call it for short. And, um, by, by giving an overview of the organization, of our activities, um, and, and, and mentioning how the specific project of the talk is something that was born out of the mission of the organization and the bridges that it makes between practitioners and theoreticians. And, and the, the bulk of the material today will be on a, on a project called Test and Contain that precisely as the title mentions, maximizes the, limited, uh, the utility of a limited number of COVID tests. Um, and eventually we'll talk about some extensions to the specific modeling framework that we have, as well as some future directions, and we can end with some discussion uh, on the topics and on the, the general branch of research that MD4SG undertakes. Uh, so without further ado, I mean, what is MD4SG? Um, it's a multi-institutional initiative that uses techniques from multiple disciplines uh, around not just STEM with optimization and ML mechanism design, but also from the social sciences. And the core mission of our organization of researchers is to improve access to opportunity for historically disadvantaged communities. And what makes the organization distinctive is precisely the multidisciplinary nature of the initiative. The fact that, that, um, that the, the problems that we tackle are multi-stakeholder, multiple institutions around the world that um, that tackle problems with an end-to-end -end approach, not just from a theoretical lens, but also with populations on the ground that precisely these solutions aim to, to help. And, um, and again, the focus is on improving access to opportunity, and we, we're a diverse and equitable and inclusive organization. And, um, and again, I mention all of these because the work from today was really born out of uh, this initiative. And, uh, and the activities that we undertake as, as an organization is that we have groups that work on specific areas of research, uh, colloquium speakers, uh, work, uh, a workshop series, and, and, and this year we actually have an inaugural ACM conference. And the, the work from today actually was born out of a working These working groups are groups of uh, researchers, either from students, junior faculty, practitioners, re researchers from the social sciences that explore a specific area together. Um, and it's a representation of individuals from multiple countries. And we'll see actually the project today spans multiple co a collaboration from multiple countries um, as well. And, uh, and the working groups that we have in the organization um, span multiple areas of research. 
Um, and in particular, the, the one from today was born out of the developing nations working group over the course of the last year with the advent of the pandemic. Um, but it, enough, I guess, so that, that, that was a brief overview and I just wanted to lightly touch upon this. It's the inspiration and the space that facilitated the work that we'll talk about today, which is uh, called Test and Contain. And, and this is a collaboration, again, uh, in the spirit of the multidisciplinary na and the interinstitutional nature that we for SG between th this, this work began while I was at the University of Oxford, um, but it's also a strong collaboration with universities in Mexico and research institutions in Mexico. We have the EPC seats um, and to uh, the public university, the YSLP, and the, a leading private university in Mexico, the Tecnológico. And so what, what is the main problem that we, that we tackle? So um, essentially, near the beginning of the pandemic, uh, some colleagues and I in this md she working group were thinking about the disparate impact that the pandemic has had on populations, not just at the country level, but also within communities within countries. And um, being from a background of, uh, of optimization and mechanism design and economics and computation, um, we began to think what sort of lens we could bring and in what ways could we help some of the difficulties of the disparate effect that COVID was having on communities around the world. And one of the observations that we converged upon was the fact that an accurate and extensive testing of the population is, has been required to combat the virus. We've seen um, that countries around the world have partaken in extensive testing activities within their capacity, and that this has been one of the fundamental uh, tools used to combat um, the pandemic. But in practice, resources can be extremely limited. And, um, and by resources, we, well, what we focus on, of course, is tests. But it can be everything ranging from tests to trained personnel, to lab time, to vaccines, actually something that we're seeing right now in practice. And the, the question that we wanted to kind of bring with an optimization approach was thinking about how to aid policymakers in maximizing the benefit of these limited resources. Um, and again, these limitations aren't necessarily uh, a feature of the global south. One thing that we saw while we were in the UK during the pandemic is, uh, in fact, that uh, resources were even limited at the time. These, these shock changes can actually um, provide the, these constraints that, uh, that we can bring a principled optimization approach to. And so in order to, uh, to begin thinking about bringing an optimization approach to this problem, the, the first thing, of course, is taking a step back and thinking about, well, what are the potential objectives that we're trying to optimize for? And two, of, two objectives that we converged upon of that, and in particular, and this is all focusing on testing resources, on qPCR tests, which um, during peak periods of the pandemic are in very low supply. And in certain countries, in Mexico in particular, we'll see are in extremely limited supply for certain populations. So, so taking a step back, what are the objectives that we really want to be using tests for? And, and two of the objectives that we converged upon was, first of all, tests are used to minimize the propagation of the virus. Um, and if we think of tests as a resource that we need to allocate, we, well, some use cases are allocating tests to those who are susceptible, or who may potentially spread the virus, or protecting certain vulnerable segments of the population as they can develop critical cases and hospitalizations. At the same time, one thing that we've seen, especially now as the pandemic has gone and come in waves, is that it's an important tool. Tests are an important tool to minimize the impact of self-isolation, of unnecessary self-isolation. A test in many scenarios nowadays is a ticket to normalcy. And, and therefore, part of this resource is also minimizing the impact of quarantine when there are blunt, um, blunt policies to make, keep the virus at bay. And of course, now in this branch of the optimization, certain characteristics are important to take into account, such as whether an individual is an essential worker. Um, uh, these individuals might have a higher priority to not be self-isolating unnecessarily. Individuals without the economic means to self-isolate may not even be able to self-isolate. So it's, it, the point is moot to even try to enforce this in the first place. This is something we've seen in, in, in the Global South in particular. And, and, and as I mentioned, the testing in this scenario is kind of a means of easing out of lockdown. And uh, so given these objectives, and another key part of our uh, kind of the path that we've taken to the solution that we implement 
is uh, this, this key primitive is that of group testing. And um, for, for those of you who may not be familiar with group testing, it's a technique that is commonly used, um, but in fact, it's been, it's, it's been around since the 40s and other, um, for other diseases, but uh, it, in essentially what, what one does is one takes multiple samples of multiple individuals, uh, multiple swabs, let's say, and mixes them into a single sample. And whereas you might have the, you, you utilize the resources of a single test to test the mixed sample. Now, uh, in its simplest form, this test will either be positive or negative. And what does this mean in the mixed sample of the group test? It means that if the result is positive, somebody within the mixed sample is infected. And if the test is negative, then everybody is, is healthy. Uh, and so this, this functionality, this primitive, actually has the potential to drastically reduce the number of tests that we need to tackle these objectives that we mentioned before. And, and an example to kind of kick off the conversation on group testing and to elucidate why this can be a very powerful tool is um, actually one of the first, if not the first example of group testing in the literature, which is uh, Dorfman's two-stage protocol from, from the 40s, um, talking about World War II and trying to test soldiers for syphilis. And it's a very simple protocol. So in this, uh, in this case, and, and this protocol elucidates some of the, the way that individuals in the group testing literature have tackled the problem of testing a population with the functionality of group testing. And uh, so to elucidate this, let's imagine that we have a population of size n. And, um, and the way that Dorfman's, and we have a certain number of tests. And Dorfman's protocol is very straightforward. Essentially, we, they, it proceeds in two stages. This population of n is partitioned into smaller disjoint groups. Um, and these disjoint groups are, uh, a, a group test is implemented upon them. Say, imagine groups of 10, let's say. And so you perform a group test on, if you have a population of 100, 10 groups of 10, you utilize 10 tests to do these group tests. Now, some of these are positive or negative. Um, the second stage of the process is those groups that came back positively are then tested individually. And the, the consequence of this is that by the end of both stages, we know precisely who is infected and who isn't infected in the population. And, um, and we know this with a potentially much smaller usage of tests than the population size. And, um, and mathematically, um, we, uh, one analysis that one can take in the setting is, imagine that of these N individuals, we know beforehand that K are infected, um, akin to knowing the infection rate of the population in a certain setting. Um, then through straightforward mathematics, one can show that in this two-stage process, in the worst case scenario, the optimal group size is, um, is uh, of the initial stage is square root of n over k. Um, well, in the, of roughly this size. And, um, and, and we get a, a, a quadratic, um, for, for constant k, we get a quadratic um, the speed up, or well, not speed up, but uh, high increased efficiency in testing from simply testing linearly the entire size of the population. And, uh, and what's interesting in this, in this issue, already this is something we that, that can use and actually something that's been used over the course of the pandemic. It was used actually quite successfully in Ghana at the initial stages of the pandemic. But, um, but groups uh, can also be more natural than simply um, a mathematical artifice. It can be households or the natural delineations of individuals. But the thing is, and, and Dorfman is a good starting point, because a lot of the group testing literature, there's, there's an extensive literature in the learning theory community on group testing, and of course in the medical community, from this computational information theoretic perspective of how many tests do we need to know uh, precisely who is and who isn't infected in the population. But the thing is, we find ourselves in practice for COVID in a regime in which not only do we not have enough tests for Dorfman, but by a large margin, we do not have enough tests for Dorfman. So what do we do in this case if we are far below the information theoretic lower bound of how many tests we need to precisely know who is infected and who isn't infected in the population, which is typically what the, the literature has sought to answer in the past. And so in, in, in essence, this actually means turning the question a little bit on its head, because instead of starting with the population and trying to figure out what are the smallest number of tests we need to perfectly know who is infected and who isn't infected, well, unfortunately, something's got to give because we have far less than the minimal amount of information theoretically. So what we actually, what we propose to relax in the scenario is knowing precisely the diagnosis of every individual in the population. So if we relax or knowing this at the end of the day, um, then we can reduce the number of tests 
that are required to um, have a certain surveillance of the population. And in this setting, actually, surprisingly simple mechanisms can yield vast improvements over, over the baseline in the extremely test limited regime. Uh, so before proceeding to the more formal mathematics and formal modeling in this case, um, I'd like to kind of walk, walk us through a specific example scenario in, in a university setting, actually, which is, as we'll see in the future, where we've deployed our, our techniques, is, which is in the university setting in Mexico. So imagine the following scenario. We, we're in a university, and this is a toy scenario, and this university has 10,000 individuals. And uh, of these 10,000 individuals, we have 20 academic, academic staff, 480 cafeteria workers, and nine and a half thousand students. Again, a toy example. Um, but in this in this scenario, imagine that this university of course students go to class, but at the same time we have a cafeteria where there's a large congregation of individuals, and of course potential super spreader events at, at the cafeteria. Um, now, given kind of these physical physical conditions for the virus, we have um, imagine now that you you have 500 COVID tested individuals, 500. QPCR testing kits. And, um, and there are actually physical limitations to how large a group can be in a group test. And um, our partners at the Oxford Pharmacology Department have implemented a, a concentration protocol that reliably does group testing for groups up to size 10. Again, we have physical constraints and, and we've precisely imported this protocol and it, with a knowledge transfer to Mexico. So for now, let's actually imagine that that's the protocol that we use. And another constraint that we have is that we cannot perform group tests beyond size 10. So these are the, the conditions that we have. The question now is what, what are good testing strategies? Notice that it's, it will be impossible to test everyone in this setting. So this, this prior objective of the group testing literature of knowing precisely who is infected and who isn't is, is outright impossible in this case. So then what do we prioritize in, in an allocation of these tests? Well, the, the mechanism that we consider uh, will be to perform disjoint group tests across the population. In a certain sense, of course, this isn't uh, one can overlap group tests. It's nothing is stopping us. But again, I mentioned before, we're going to focus on a, sub, a simple class of mechanisms that have, um, that already demonstrate benefits. And the simple class in this case is simply our tests will be disjoint. Namely, no individual will ever partake in more than one test in the testing allocation that we have. Uh, and the uh, testing policy is, of course, only as useful as the subsequent containment policy that is a function of the results of the testing policy. So the containment policy that we, that we use is namely, if a test is positive, an individual is told to self-isolate. Notice that this could be a group test. Um, and, and if it's negative, they continue as normal. And again, let's talk a little bit on this prior point. If a test is positive, they're told to self-isolate. Notice that it could be the case that I'm a perfectly healthy individual yet I'm in, 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 an, in a positive group test. In this case, I will be told to self-isolate unnecessarily. This is kind of a necessary pitfall of the fact that we have such a limited testing um, quota. And so in this regime of how we allocate tests in this disjoint fashion, we're going to measure the performance of testing allocations via four metrics in the toy example of the university we have. The first metric that we, that, that we look at is how many critical COVID cases do we prevent? in this and it's a single step of contagion so it's a, it's a simple model in the sense that we allocate tests we see the results we contain individuals accordingly and subsequently infection happens and the question is how many cases did we prevent by this allocation in this containment policy now the the following three objectives actually have to do with this point that i was mentioning before which is an individual can be in the positive test yet be healthy and uh, these, these three metrics now are how many academic staff are unnecessarily self-isolated, how many cafeteria workers are unnecessarily self-isolated, and how many students are unnecessarily self-isolated. Notice that the moment that we allocate tests, we can quantify these, these, these four metrics. And uh, so let's look at, the, at a baseline. So what is currently the case um, that, that happens in multiple scenarios? Well, in, in many universities, if, if uh, in the extremely limited regime, uh, if, if they're conscious of academic staff, then perhaps, remember, we had 20 academic staff. Of these 500 tests, perhaps they allocate 20 to precisely know who is infected and who isn't infected amongst the academic staff. Um, for all other individuals, 
Um, testing in this limited regime actually tends to not be a surveillance-based tool, but rather a confirmation-based tool for whether when individuals are being symptomatic whether they we can confirm whether they have the virus or not. In which case, if an individual is already showing symptoms, they may be tested, which again is not very informative from a surveillance perspective. Um, and so there's a bias in the results and in many cases we'll go and notice. And so if we try to plot the performance of this protocol amongst these four metrics that I mentioned before, uh, we'll see that in this setting, uh, we prevent very few critical cases because we don't catch many viral cases in the population. At the same time, since we only ever test individuals um, individually and not in groups, in groups, there will it will not be the case that individuals be will be isolated unnecessarily, uh, because this only occurs if there's a, a group and I'm healthy and I'm an effective te uh, group test. And so, on the other hand, there are no unnecessary self isolations in this allocation. So, th so this is the performance of this of this baseline that we see in these graphs. Now let's try to now implement the functionality of group testing. So remember, we have 500 tests. And so a potential first step that we could do is, well, we can do groups of size 10. So let's choose a random assignment of 500 groups of size 10 from the university. Um, and again, disjoint um, random 500 groups from the university, put these individuals in a group test, and we have the containment protocol. From before, if positive, self-isolate, if negative, continue to, to university. Now, the benefits of this are that now we cover a vastly larger percentage of the population. Half of the population will be in some form of test. And of course, we can also actually estimate the prevalence of the virus if this allocation is randomized. Um, but the drawbacks are that we might unnecessarily self-isolate academic staff. Imagine that a professor is in a group of 10 and it comes up. And perhaps the university is in dire need of professors teaching. This is perhaps undesirable from the policy perspective. Um, and at the same time, remember that a large amount of congregation at the university happens at the cafeteria. It could be the case that of the 50% that is untested, a cafeteria worker is there, an infected cafeteria worker that causes a super spreader event. So these are kind of two uh, drawbacks to this initial approach to using group testing. And again, if we try to informally map out the performance of this strategy uh, with respect to our metrics, we, we see that we catch more cases. But now since we have larger group sizes of size 10, um, we have unnecessary self-isolations in each of the segments because I could be healthy and in a positive group because these groups are of size 10. Uh, so now that's actually the, the approach that we take um, and that we've implemented and then we provide to policymakers is what we call variable group testing. In this case, um, what ultimately what we'll see later is variable group testing consists of a of a segmentation, of a categorization of the population in terms of characteristics that are important for the spread of the virus. Um, here we have a natural characterization that is given by virtue of the problem in the professors, cafeteria workers, and students. Um, and, and what we do is we decide how many tests to allocate to each segment of the population and what group size these tests are to be allocated at for each segment of the population. And um, so given this general framework, a potential testing strategy in this framework would be, let's say that, we, remember, we have 500 tests. We allocate 20 to professors individually. So that's 20 of our tests and our budget. We allocate 96 tests of size five, uh, which is 480 individuals overall, to cafeteria workers. And we allocate 384 tests of size 10 for, for random students, 3,840 students. Um, Notice actually going back that first we cover all the professors individually, we cover all the cafeteria workers, and we still cover a significant portion of the population. So if you look at the performance with respect to our metrics, we see that um, since we covered cafeteria workers, we mitigate potential super spreader events. Um, and so we've caught more potential critical cases. Um, since we have group size of one for professors, we don't have unnecessary self-isolations in my staff. Your staff. And notice that we have less unnecessary self-isolations for cafeteria workers over students. This is by virtue of the fact that the groups are of size five in cafeteria workers instead of size 10. The smaller the group, the more that unnecessary self-isolation is mitigated. Because remember, this only happens if I'm healthy and in a positive group. And the probability of this decreases if my group size decreases. Um, now, within this framework, of course, we can play around. 
And a potential second secondary strategy that we can think of, another allocation would be instead of 96 tests that group work, that's a cafeteria work of size five, say that we allocate 48 of size 10. We still cover the cafeteria workers, but we free up 48 tests that can then be allocated to students as well. So now imagine we allocate another 48 tests to students of size 10. Now in, the, in this setting, we've covered all the cafeteria workers, we've covered more students, and we actually cover more potential infections. So this yellow bar is even higher because we've prevented more cases than before. At the same time, we still have a necessary, no unnecessary self-isolation for academic staff, but notice that what have we paid for in order to have this increase is that we now have more unnecessary self-isolations amongst cafeteria workers. And so if we put all four of these allocations and solutions side by side with respect to these four metrics, we can actually compare and contrast them. And, um, and in fact, we can put ourselves in the shoes of a policymaker that is deciding what to do with these 500 tests and trying to understand what the inherent trade-offs are of different allocations of tests to the population. And the first most salient, actually the most salient feature of all of this is the fact that if you look closely, this allocation right here, the top right one, which um, was uniformly randomly allocating groups of size 10, is categorically worse in every single metric than these two allocations below. Um, and as we'll see in the subsequent formalization, it's in the multi-objective paradigm, it's Pareto dominated by these other allocations. And so one thing that we'll be doing for policymakers is actually systematically removing allocations, which is this one, because it's simply worse on all axes of success and only presenting other um, solutions such as these other three that are incomparable in a certain sense. They exemplify the inherent trade-offs that we have between different allocations, between the competing objectives of preventing cases of the virus and minimizing unnecessary self-isolation. So this, this Pareto frontier is what we'll be using as solution concept and what we present as candidate strategies to policymakers. And so now um, I, I guess we can dig a little bit deeper into the, um, into the actual modeling, um, I guess very befitting of QMNet. Uh, so the, the way that we model this, this problem um, is, uh, is, is, well, first of all, the, the base technique is that of uniform group testing, which is the simplest form of group testing, where imagine that we have a population of size N, and if we don't have segments in the population, uh, a testing protocol in this family of allocations that we look at would be to simply, we simply need to specify how many tests are going to be given to the population and what group sizes. Uh, so T is the number of tests and G is the group sizes. And so we have T, uh, T tests of group size G disjointly allocated to the population. Um, but the, as I mentioned before, the family of uh, testing allocations and containment mechanisms we look at is that a variable group testing? Um, so in this, uh, the, what we assume is we assume, and fundamentally we assume a testing budget beforehand. So we have a certain number, capital T number of tests that are to be allocated to the population. We have a fixed population of N individuals. And as I mentioned before, we have a categorization of the population. So we have K categories. And in the, in the previous example, we had three, you know, professors, cafeteria workers, students. We can have more nuanced categories in practice. But every single one of these categories is going to have important characteristics that quantify important um, aspects of viral spread in the population. So first we have the number of individuals in that category. And then the next three parameters actually um, exemplify a simple model of infection that we take into account. The first is what is the baseline probability of infection? And this is, you can think of as the infection rate of that segment of the population. The second is um, between segments, the connectivity between segments. And what this means for, for DIJ is if you pick a specific individual from uh, segment I, uh, DIJ is um, how many individuals from segment J could that individual receive the virus from? Uh, it's not necessarily symmetric, but um, essentially it's, uh, how many individuals am I susceptible to receive the virus from it in this other segment of the population? And um, pi ij is just simply the transmission probability given these, these contacts. So these, these three parameters govern a very simple uh, model of propagation of the virus over a population. And um, 
And we consider testing strategies that consist of disjoint tests per segment uh, of different groups. And so now we have a, a very clear cut family of allocations to the population, which you can parameterize by uh, this pair of vectors, which is how many tests per segment and what are the group sizes that we use per segment. Um, and there are very simple constraints to this family of feasible allocations, um, given right here in school points. And again, I mentioned that we have a physical constraint to how large a group test can actually be in practice. And of course, we must respect the budget of tests that we have overall. And so this is the feasible family of allocations in the testing and containment protocol. Now we need to quantify the metrics that I mentioned before for a given population. The bars that we had, we can actually um, give, uh, uh, give a model to and, and quantify in, in the simplified model of contagion. So the, we, our, our model of contagion is um, very simple. It's just a single step of contagion. So the way that we, uh, we model everything is that we assume that for a given segment, initially, each individual in the probability in, in, the, in the segment is infected with um, independent and identical probability of PI, a Bernoulli random variable. And so first infection, baseline infection happens. Subsequently, we test according to the feasible testing allocation from before where we defined feasibility as before. And then these tests inform containment strategies where, as we mentioned, if a test is positive, everyone in that test is told to self-isolate. And if that test is negative, those individuals are allowed to continue as normal. And after this testing and containment, we, this is the single step of contagion we, we assume. Namely, given the baseline infection, given those individuals that are, um, given the quarantine that happens after the testing, some amount of infection happens as per the parameters that we mentioned before. And th this infection um, is going to tell us how many cases we prevented or didn't prevent according to our allocation. And so I just want to take a step back to the objectives I mentioned, I mentioned before. So we want to minimize the propagation of the virus. Um, so again, potentially prioritizing people like cafeteria workers who might be super spreaders um, and people with a high baseline infection rate or potentially high exposure to other segments. Um, and at the same time, we want to minimize the impact of the necessary self-isolation. In the university context, it's going to be essential workers like professors in a, in a given period of crunch time of teaching, for example, where the university simply needs to have staff uh, on, on the ground for, for teaching. Or, uh, as we've seen before in other contexts, individuals without the economic needs to self-isolate. And multiple reasons why we could have different priorities for self-isolation, um, but these will be encapsulated in the metrics that we have. And so the first objective that, that we look at is this healthcare objective, which is the, the yellow bar that we saw in the, in the toy example from before. And this quantifies the critical cases that are prevented in this, this single round of, of contagion. And by prevented, I mean with respect to everything is relative. And so the baseline that we pick is simply with respect to no allocation tests, as if nothing happened. And we allow the, the, the virus to simply uh, go through the population. Um, and to, I, I don't want to dwell too much on the, on the mathematical details, but just uh, for those of you that are interested, we, it, it's, all of this is just a simple exercise in, um, in probability, uh, given the model that we have. And so we, we can define the, this objective in terms of auxiliary variables, the first being the probability that an individual in a category is not tested. Remember, because the allocation is actually applied in a randomized fashion, so we have a well-defined expression for this. Um, given this, we have the probability that an individual in a segment is healthy and not quarantining. And again, those that are healthy and not quarantining are those susceptible to infection in a subsequent stage of, um, of propagation of the virus. So again, these are the, the key people we want to count whether we prevented their infection or not uh, after the testing. Um, and, and ultimately, um, given these, these variables, I won't well, into the other ones, um, as we have more time, we can always talk about this more at the end. We can quantify probability in terms of probability um, these um, these cases and expectation that are prevented. Um, and I, I guess I, I to, in in the sake of time, I don't want to um, focus too much on these, but uh, these are all very simple to compute. Essentially, randomized allocation of tests means we can quantify with what probability one isn't tested. And then um, given that someone isn't tested, then um, 
Uh, we can quantify the probability that someone is healthy and not quarantining because this, this only happens in two scenarios, namely if I'm healthy, untested, or healthy, and in a negative group test. And um, then we, we look at the expected probability of transmission from individuals in the JF segment to uh, an individual in the IF segment. And again, this takes into account the amount of exposure between different segments um, and the individuals that are, because I, I can only be infected within the IF segment from people from the JF segments if they are untested and infected. So basically this, this quantifies um, of those, in expectation, those untested and infected in the JF segment, and it takes into account the probability of transmission given uh, that fact. And, uh, and finally, putting all this together, we can com compute for a given allocation how many critical cases will occur in that second step of infection, and we can compare this to the, um, to the baseline, uh, which is how many critical cases occur if we did not have any testing at all, this is zero, zero allocation. Um, now, in a similar vein, we look at the quarantine objectives. So previously, I wanted to the healthcare objective. Now, for a given allocation, and for each of the K segments, we define an objective. So here we have K objective functions, um, which are the quarantine objectives per segment. And what this encapsulates is, in the I segment of the population, uh, how many individuals, after the testing and containment protocol, are healthy, but actually told to contain. Um, and it's something that we want to minimize uh, if we want to prevent unnecessary self-isolation. And, and again, this is just a straightforward exercise in probability, um, and we can compute the, this expression at the bottom, which is the expected number of individuals that, um, uh, I mean, we can do this per group test, and then since we have TI independent group tests, then we just multiply the expression uh, in the penultimate bullet point by the TI number of tests that we, that we have. And, uh, and so finally, we, so we have all these, we have these K plus one objectives in uh, the given instantiation of the, of, of the, of the model. And these objectives are at, at odds. And for the very reasons that we saw in, in the example with uh, the toy example of the school. And if I want to cover more segments of the population, more of the population than the budget, this necessarily involves having larger groups, which necessarily involves potentially self-isolating unnecessarily larger segments of the population. And so I have to, ideally, that there, there are inherent trade-offs between these two objectives. And, um, and it's difficult to explicitly place relative importance of each of these objectives. I mean, in, in mathematically, theoretically, we could have a single objective that's a convex combination of all of these. But in, in actual practice, and we're bringing this tool to actual practice, this is, uh, not only is it um, difficult to do, imagine, um, querying policymakers in terms of the relative importance of uh, self-isolation of, uh, of a cafeteria worker versus a critical case that was prevented. Is how to put these on the same scale is incredibly difficult already, but, but also problematic too. I mean, these are vastly different things to be weighed. Um, and so what we can do akin to the, the toy example is we can rule out certain allocations which, which are Pareto dominated. Um, and what we mean by Pareto dominated in this context is that if we have two allocations, TG and T prime, prime G prime, two feasible allocations, uh, the, the, the allocation TG will Pareto dominate T prime G prime, basically if and only if um, it performs just as well as the other allocation in every one of the components, and it performs strictly better in one of them. Um, and again, what we saw in the previous example was that at the top right allocation was Pareto dominated by the bottom two. And, um, and we have a specific relation in this context. And what we can do with the Pareto dominance relation is that we can actually compute, now that we have actually a fixed family of allocations, the set of all allocations that aren't Pareto dominated, this is the Pareto frontier. And these solutions maximally exemplify these trade-offs that are fundamentally there in this limited testing regime. And, um, for this specific problem instance given by the parameters, um, algorithmically we provide solutions along the Pareto frontier to help policymakers to, to guide their decision making in, in this limited testing regime. And so just to give an example of, um, of how this works, um, 
we, 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 had, we ran a couple of simulations on some toy examples to, to see the, the fundamental trade-offs of different solutions along the Pareto frontier. And um, we developed a, a SIRQ, susceptible, infected, recovered, and also quarantined model um, on the simulated university population, where again, we have 9,000 students, the first category, 500 cafeteria workers, the second category, professors, the third category, and in this example, it's assumed that professors and cafeteria workers are very exposed. They're, they're very connected to um, more so than students. And this makes sense as professors give a lecture, um, cafeteria workers are in the cafeteria. And, and if we have the, these exposure parameters given by DIJ, then we, we can put them in this matrix. And we can see that the larger values, such as um, uh, 24 and 23, are actually encapsulating the fact that many students can affect the professor and many students can infect the cafeteria work, um, uh, respectively. And um, we pick, in, in this setting, we pick two um, allocations. Um, oh, sorry. And so each time step, uh, so some of the other uh, model parameters that we picked is that we had an effect, um, a recovery probability given by gamma here, and, um, and a uh, transmission probability given by beta. It's typical in these SIRQ models. All this chosen to emulate the R0 reproductive reproduction value of approximately three, uh, which I guess should potentially be revised given the delta variant, which is, is higher in, in practice. But anyways, to, to kind of elucidate the point, we picked two solutions on the Pareto frontier of this, of this context of this uh, simulated um, scenario. Uh, the first, and we'll see in the graph following, prioritizes minimizing professor quarantine over cafeteria quarantine. Um, and cafeteria and student quarantine. And the second one prioritizes both professors and cafeteria workers equally. And, and if we see, um, we, we ran a simulation over multiple days at the outbreak, uh, providing a limited testing budget at every single um, week of the outbreak, where this testing budget was um, chosen according to um, a family from the Korea frontier um, at, at, that, at that week. Um, and the, the, blue, the blue strategies here are the first allocation, which where you can see the solid line for professors is much lower than the dotted line for cafeteria workers, which um, again, exemplifies the fact that we have prioritized minimizing quarantine of professors. The second allocation strategy, which is given by red, you can see that two lines are actually much closer to each other, where we've given equal importance. So in, in, in practice, in, in, in simulations at least, we see that uh, over multiple time steps, we get the qualitative behavior that uh, the um, that the model um, hints at. Now, the um, I'd like to kind of talk about all of this is is the modeling aspect of things, but the the most important part of the work is actually, and this goes in line with MD for SG as an initiative, is precisely bridging research and practice. Um, and this entire time, we've been working with Mexican universities. And a, a fundamental part of our work has been implementing these techniques in Mexican higher education institutions, especially as they return to in-person teaching and in ways of coming in and out of the virus. And what we've done is we've created software to A, facilitate parameter estimation for the contagion model of what we, what we mentioned previously, to compute the Pareto frontier of the testing allocations given a very limited budget that the universities give us, and to um, at least visually enable a simple and intuitive selection of allocations from the Pareto frontier for the policymakers. And, and currently, uh, the ITESM, Instituto Tecnológico de Estudios Superiores de Monterrey, is piloting our solution on all their campuses. Um, and this is a combined student and staff population of over 96,000 individuals. So at, at each campus, the software is being run to decide how to utilize the budget of tests that they, because they have, a, they have a budget of tests for campus. And to give an idea of the, of the, the uh, limitations typically this is on the order of uh, one to five percent of the student population on a bi-weekly or weekly basis so again we're in the very limited testing regime and um so first of all how do we extrapolate the relevant parameters this is this first first part of the pipeline and so we you do this with data from the university that pertains to course records attendance records buildings that are visited by individuals covid results test results and they also have residual water testing where they can test the residual water for, um, for whether there are COVID uh, particles. And 
what's in here, data is maintained in an anonymized internal database. And, and what we do is we simply provide the framework for them to extrapolate those parameters internally and share those parameters to us. And notice that what's important is that these parameters are aggregates over segments of the population. And the segments that they pick for their categories, um, which naturally fall into place given the administration that they have, is uh, faculty as one segment, administrative assistance as another. Um, they, they, their campuses also have middle school and high school students. So that is one segment of the campuses and also undergraduate graduate students. Um, so the, the, the data for these is maintained internally. We only get aggregates for the algorithm. Um, and, and this helps maintain a, an amount of trust. And uh, to, to estimate the connectivity between segments, what they do is they compute the average number of interactions between individuals of different categories, which they have given classroom data, given building data. Transmission probabilities are, are estimated given classroom characteristics. There's an amount of literature on that take into account um, the size of the classroom, the ventilation, et cetera, to kind of estimate these. And probabilities of infection are done on the basis of COVID tests, and all of this also in conjunction with their epidemiologists that they have at the, at the university. And, um, and what we've done for the final step of this pipeline is helping them search within the Puerto Rico frontier for specific allocations. And we have a web app that they use locally to explore and visualize these trade-offs, much like what we saw in the toy example. And what they can do is they can actually specify a target performance for each objective. And um, actually, typically, there are a very large amount of allocations, even on the Perio frontier. So uh, one thing, a key feedback from them is that to, to actually facilitate the decision making, it's ideal to prune this space for the users. And so what we've done is to only consider a certain subset of the potential group sizes and to bucket solutions of a similar performance to reduce the space of potential allocations even more for the decision making. And so the, the, the tool that we have looks like this where um, on the left, they can set specific thresholds of performance that they want per segment. Um, and uh, on the right, we have these bar charts similar to what we had before in uh, the toy example. And, uh, and on the bottom, there are multiple solutions they can look through, they can save some and pick which solution they want amongst those that are on the frontier and that are filtered. And in, uh, to give an idea of how the, this tool in practice operates in, in preliminary runs, of the pilot at a, one of their largest campuses, in the algorithm explored roughly 3,000 allocations and identified 80 on the frontier, given the parameters that were extrapolated from the, from the campus. And after bucketing, this reduced to 20. So this vastly reduces the potential space of testing allocations that they have. And from this, they, it's, it's greatly helped the decision-making process over the past now three, four months that they've been using the, the pilot. And, uh, so just some reflections on bridging research and practice in Mexico um, is that a critical factor of the success of this, um, again, for those who might be interested in bridging research and practice in, with the Global South and in other contexts similar to the one in Mexico, is we actually, a, a key component of our partnership were local research councils, um, late, essentially the state equivalent of the NSF in Mexico, Red Nacesit. They helped us connect with many policymakers, with uh, universities locally. Um, again, uh, a great uh, help in this entire process. Uh, very, very um, helpful individuals. And another aspect of kind of the, the success of the collaboration is also establishing trust with regards to sensitive data. And I mentioned before that information was held locally and that aggregates are being used in the core of the computation. So there's a lot of privacy preservation is an important part of the collaboration. And of course, and one thing that truly helped in our context was the composition of the team, um, where many, some of us are from Mexico, some of us are currently in Mexico as a part of the team, and this interinstitutional collaboration inherently was actually a, a, a great help in getting things forward in terms of uh, speaking with individuals in the, the local language and, and really pushing things forward. Um, I'd like to, so one final thing, um, I, I want to talk about is uh, extensions and that we're currently working on and this is work in progress, um, which can be encapsulated by the term of finding the healthy. And so that all of this kind of, I, I, and I, I just want to end this kind of like bring a little bit more of the concept why keep testing is such an interesting tool and it brings forth many interesting questions on for quantitative um, applications and optimization applications because 
Up until now, we've focused on a scenario where the population is not in lockdown. They're as normal and we're simply trying to find the infected. But when in lockdown, the objective to this is actually dual, uh, or not even just then, as a, kind of in this, in this transition between the two, um, which is namely we have to try and find those who are healthy. There's been a, a large amount of kind of discourse that's like changed to this now, and, and the impact of self-isolation, finding those that are healthy, they continue with uh, normalcy. And group testing provides non-trivial optimizations perspective this objective as well. And so let's look at this toy example where imagine that we have a firm. Um, and in this firm, there's an owner, some managers, four managers, 10 technicians, and five assistants. And in order for this firm to operate, it needs uh, one owner at least, two managers, two technicians, and no assistants. And, uh, and suppose that we can do groups in this example of, of size 15, um, and that we have a budget of six tests, and, and I'm kind of the owner of this firm. And that every single one of these segments of the population has a different infection, a baseline infection probability. So some segments are much more exposed to the virus than others. And the question here is what's the best strategy? And again, what am I trying to do in this case? I'm trying to A, get some individuals to actually have the essential individuals that I need in order to come into the office. And at the same time, maximize the number of healthy individuals to come to get the most, uh, to get the most help in running, running the firm. And so, um, well, this is the more general mathematical formulation of the same, um, uh, of the same uh, idea, where uh, what we can do is we can actually, for a given group test, and if infections are IID, we can compute the expected number of healthy individuals given the fact that I applied this group test. There's this function that here is defined by H of A. It's a simple expression probabilistically. And so going back to this example, um, if I test these five essential individuals with a single group test that uses five of my six tests, and imagine that they're all healthy, so great, I can run my firm, this leaves me with one extra test. And this one extra test, uh, what can I do with it? I could put everyone else in a single group. There are 15 remaining individuals after my five tests. If I put them all in one group, 5.44 individuals that are healthy are found in expectation. And However, if I consider a different group, one of size 10, uh, which is two managers, two technicians, and five assistants, this provides 6.15 healthy individuals in expectation. So over two testing periods, I get one more person working at my firm on average. And again, this is a very trivial example with like one test that was as a surplus and that the objective is, is maximizing the number of healthy people that are found. But the, precisely this example is that we're actually now wanting to bring to underprivileged communities and schools in Mexico, where um, this previous example, uh, it maximized the healthy individuals who could work, but the framework that we're applying to schools is we want to maximize verifiably healthy students attending class. If you want to absolutely run classes in a verifiably safe manner, then we can apply tests and only those that are in a negative test can go to class. Um, but the thing is, now we can differentiate between different students in terms of their needs. Certain students have a different uh, need to be in class in person by virtue of uh, whatever resources they might have at home. Uh, at least in Mexico, certain students don't have an internet connection, wouldn't be able to act, where a lack of in-person teaching is a massive setback. And so we can differentially quantify the benefit of a student attending classes in person. And, um, and we can apply the same framework from before, where we're trying to choose an allocation and maximize the weighted utility of healthy individuals found to go verifiably healthily go to class. And we're, we're in the process of beginning to implement this in San Luis Potosí in Mexico um, in certain workshops um, to have also further community involvement um, in, in terms of the solutions that we provide. But, uh, but with this actually, it, uh, I'd like to end with an overview and some just some of the future directions beyond this. Um, well, so the, the overview really is that in, in the regime where we have an extremely limited number of tests and resources, it's important to take a step back and use an objective-based framework to decide these allocations. Um, and we've seen that the primitive group testing can be vastly useful for expanding the reach of a limited testing bucket. And so policymakers have to balance trade-offs between containing the virus and, um, and essentially affecting the, the, the fabric of society. Um, and we can bridge 
research in terms of modeling these two competing objectives in practice by providing user-friendly software for university policymakers to explore these trade-offs and to have a, a more principled and simple intuitive way of understanding what the trade-offs are and, and different allocations that they can have. And so just some, some future work in this area. Um, well, first of all, we can think about having a hybrid optimization where we, I mentioned going in and going out of um, lockdown, where it could be the case that there's a segment and part of that segment is in lockdown, part of it isn't, and the allocations to decide how to move people from lockdown to non-lockdown. You can stagger lockdown. There's kind of a time dependency as well that isn't necessarily taken into account here. Um, COVID tests, PCR tests are actually not binary in the results. There's a, they're from zero to 36. Above 36 is, um, is healthy and below 35 is a different quantities of viral load. And so there's a huge potential for a phasing analysis of biomarker data this, uh, to, to get a better idea of how many people are infected in a group test, not just some. Uh, we're currently implementing reinforcement learning techniques. To, it, it, this, we have a very specific um, policy space and very specific objectives that we can optimize over. Uh, and, and this kind of understand what time dependence might imply in terms of solutions that we have. Um, and, and of course, we can extend these, the, these ideas to other resources. I mean, vaccines, as mentioned before, health professionals. Um, you can look at strategic behavior between the population as something that is actually being seen quite heavily in our partner universities. And, and we can try to accordingly model compliance to, to certain um, containment strategies that are, that are given. Um, and, 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 and just to kind of bring this all together, I, I, I want to end talking about mechanism design for social good like once more, where this is a, a real um, good example of how MB4 actually works in motion. This is a collaboration between researchers in Oxford and Mexico, policymakers from the state of San Potosí, academic administrators from these universities, and the very communities that we work with. We've actually had multiple conversations with the, with the student body, with um, in, the, in the communities that we want to actually work with in terms of opening schools and marginalized communities. So really this entire conversation, this form of conversation, is uh, very distinctive uh, of md for sg um, We're a global organization with multiple participants. Uh, if this is something that interests uh, people within this group, I strongly encourage uh, any of you, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm glad to answer any questions about md for sg um, and, uh, and thank you. Um, thank you for taking the time to, to hear about this work. Um, I'm really grateful to, to have shared this with, with all of you. And apologies for keeping people for for so long. Uh, thanks very much for that awesome talk, Francisco. Yeah, can we give you a virtual hand clap for that? Yeah. We, uh, we have a, an apology in the chat of Ben and Ben needed to leave at, uh, for another meeting. And I imagine that was the case for a few people. Um, I thought this talk was really cool. Bring in applied probability and optimal multi-objective control. Uh, and and epidemiology. Uh, I was wondering, would, would anyone else like to start with a, a question uh, before I before I mention any? Now, perhaps perhaps I'll go first. Uh, there's a couple of well, um, a couple of things I was I was wondering about the model when you were, when you were discussing it. I guess one of them was uh, like the assumption that these tests are like a hundred percent accurate and that there's no false positives or negatives. I was wondering how much, like if there was a small increase in one of those rates, if there'd be a, a big difference. And on the other side, I was thinking of when the group sizes get larger, um, I guess it, an optimal strategy, if you were in one of these uh, groups that was positive, uh, where, where a case was found, um, perhaps you'd think, oh, I'm in such a massive group, the chance of me actually being positive is so low, I'm not going to bother isolating. I was wondering, is there any, along those two lines, is there anything you can, you can say? Those are great questions and they fit in. So for the, in, with regards to your first question, it's definitely really, this is a, a very interesting um, consideration in terms of the physical limits of, of, of group testing. So part of the reason for why these physical limits are, for example, 10, 
the protocol isn't necessarily that that test cannot be done at higher tests, but simply that since we work with uh, with uh, clinicians, that uh, ultimately that's kind of the cutoff after which the the false negative rate becomes too high for comfort for clinicians. So they're kind of this ten is chosen in such a way that it's uh, basically the no no loss of sensitivity with the tests. And, and of course, it, we can model the loss of sensitivity, and it's important to, and it's something that, from a computer science and optimization perspective, we almost see it as more natural, as saying, well, okay, let's push it further. You know, like, we lose some sensitivity, but we potentially gain more in terms of the objectives at the end of the day. And this is kind of one of, one of those interesting points where the conversation with, with, with policymakers and with clinicians has imposed kind of this, this constraint in the, in the space where the, in, a, in order to actually implement these, in order to kind of legally be able to tell people that uh, there's kind of some, some form of uh, certainty with the test results, that we've got to kind of physically limit the test up to the size. But definitely there, there's potential for human error. Um, group testing is also logistically more difficult too. I mean, at the end of the day, you still have to clump resources and keep track of the information flow. So I think a really interesting mm -hmm. step would be to quantify potential mistakes in the information flow as, since they do happen and how, what this can do. Now, with, with regards to your second question, um, this is it's really interesting with the kind of the final two points of future work, which is compliance and strategic behavior. Um, mm -hmm. And essentially, what, what's there, what, well, ideally one person that can be done to mitigate some of this is potentially not tell people the size of the group in which they are being put in. So that, that mm -hmm. could be private knowledge. Of course, if they have knowledge of the mechanism, they may have some uh, knowledge of the potential group sizes in which they might be put in. But the second fact of this, and of course this is uh, difficult to control, is the fact that if I'm told to self-isolate by virtue of having been in a group test, this means less. Uh, and it potentially means less to behavior after the fact, where if I had been infected, then after the fact, of course, there's some amount of antibodies and minimization in terms of subsequent infections, at least for a while. And so I might act more, rec more recklessly. And so if I'm in a positive test and I mistakenly act more recklessly, they can have further repercussions. And this is where hopefully mm -hmm. a further time step analysis just might kind of unveil potential pitfalls with, with, this, um, with, with this respect. But, uh, um, but again, these are, these are all very interesting questions to think about from this mechanism design to game theory perspective, which uh, for now we, we, haven't, we haven't done. Um, and, and all this that I also want to mention that uh, all this is a game of give and take with policymakers when it comes to, uh, it's the first time that I, I work on something that's being implemented to this scale. And part of the give and take with policymakers is that the budgets that they actually use for surveillance are only a, a portion of the budgets. Uh, there's still some amount of budget that they keep for contact tracing after the fact. Um, and so it's not entirely decided to be allocated under this allocation. Rather, the surveillance is done under a budget in this way. And then as a safeguard, there's, there's a certain amount of contact tracing happening afterwards. So this has been kind mm -hmm. of a little bit of this, of this leeway between the theoretical modeling and motivation and the actual practical implementation of that. Uh, okay, so so the positive cases like their close contacts might be tested as well in that extra allocation that you're mentioning. Okay, they can all subject to the budget. I mean, it could very well be the case that like everything is positive, and even for that, there aren't sufficiently many tests. And so it's one of these things where you know, we have to do the best given the potential worst case scenario. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was wondering about how, like, the level of virus in the population would change as well. Like, if there's very few cases then you could theoretically batch everyone like huge group sizes together i mean of course in in, in a theoretical world not um or but and then but then if there's more and more cases in the other extreme where most people like lots of people are infected then it sort of gets less and less useful to like all your group have just come back positive right mm -hmm. yeah. this is actually where the the biomarker data is really interesting because the reason that we yeah. get false um false negatives is because we, we, the worst case scenario for a group test is if one person is infected and everybody else is healthy. Because what you're doing is you're essentially diluting the viral load, running it through the test. And the moment mm. that you dilute, if you dilute too much, you don't perceive the virus and you make a okay. mistake. 
And, um, and so this is where biomarker data is. Usually if, if you have a group and many are affected, then the, your group test will probably be okay. And, but, but again, this is where the, the line falls between what we're okay with as clinicians versus computer scientists versus policymakers. And, um, and, it, and it also opens the door for this Bayesian approach or potential other kind of more creative ways of putting together groups. You can take different combinations of samples and, and uh, it doesn't have to be a uniform equal representation for a sample. You can take a higher weight for one, lower weight another. So there's a, a very rich space of things that you can do with, uh, with group testing. Yeah. Yeah, I was struck that I'd never even heard of group testing until about this time last year. It's such an elegant and simple idea. And it was my, um, my fiance was in her hometown in China, in this small village of 11 million people. And they had like a dozen cases. So they just went through and, and tested everybody in batches of 10. And uh, they, within a couple of days, they, they got 9 million tests out. It's just shocking to see how, how other countries yeah. <laughs> act like this sometimes. <laughs> Well, I guess maybe we should um, thank you again and and, uh, and uh, not take too much more of your time. And no, think about it. Might, might I, I, I forgot, I have one little plug just at the end, which is um, yeah. I mentioned before with MD for SG that we have an inaugural conference. It's an ACM conference, it's the Association of Computing Machinery, that um, is, is this year. It's, uh, it's actually in October, the first week of October. And it, the goal of the event is to highlight work of this nature, essentially, kind of bringing together techniques from multiple disciplines, this interdisciplinary approach, and this focus on helping marginalized communities. And, um, and we have two tracks with the conference, research and policy and practice track, and it, it builds off a workshop series. And, um, and I, I, I feel that there are many people in this network uh, that might potentially be interested, and I, I strongly urge them to come Check it out. There'll be interesting talks. We have multiple keynote speakers from around the world talking about topics not just related to COVID, but um, various, various uh, branches of policy of this intersection between research and policy, research and practice. Um, so just wanted one. one. If, if, this, if this sort of work is interesting, please feel free to come. In fact, uh, I'll be giving a talk on this very work at the, at the conference, so feel free to skip that one out if you do come because you'll have to see much more than the 17 minutes at the at the conference that we'll be talking about. Um, but yeah, uh, we, but in, in the chat, David, David was asking, is there an online component to EA AMO? I guess, yeah. I guess maybe the It'll whole thing is entirely virtual. The, the entire yeah. thing will be virtual. It'll take place on on Zoom for for conversations, and we'll have multiple events on Gather Town. And we're trying to mm. really foster actually communication with practitioners. So we'll have multiple events where we bring practitioners in. To, mm. to talk about these problems that exist on the ground um, and try to, to pair them with researchers who might have expertise or interest in, in, um, in, in, in helping tackle some of these problems that, around the world um, and that are potentially common to multiple regions around the world too. Yeah, that, is, that does sound very cool. I guess sometimes in Australia, we're in the worst of all time zones so that we're up at you know 3 a.m. for some really cool things happening in America or Europe. But other than that, I think it could be something really cool and, and we can send that around. <laughs> now, hopefully it's not, I, I think it might be a, you're right, it's a, this, this constraint is always difficult, but we have, I, we've tried as much as possible to come in different time zones, but I think Australia is always yeah. a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I guess um, maybe I'll stop the recording there. And thanks very much again. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation.